hold it. Uh, so, ma'am, don't worry. When uh, Superb will be switching the slide, it will come online, ma'am. Don't worry. It will I just have to go to the slide. Sure, That's all, right? Sure, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Sunil ji. We are live. Good evening, all. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 277, 18th in the UVA module. Today, we have with us Dr. Ankush Kavali from Narana Netralaya, Bangalore to speak to us on viral retinitis. May I now request Dr. Mamta to please introduce the speaker for today. Good evening, all. It's my pleasure to introduce one of our very bright uveitis specialists from Narayan Netralaya, and Dr. Ankush Kavali. He's done a long-term fellowship in uveitis at Arvindaya Hospital, Madurai, under the guidance of Dr. Ratinam in 2011. He also was a sponsored ICO observer fellow with Dr. Foster at Mass Eye Research and Surgery Institution in Boston, 2012. He currently holds a position consultant from Uveitis Services, Narayan Netralia, Bangalore. He's published over 40 articles <coughs> exclusively in Uveitis. And he's co-authored 47 articles in peer-reviewed journals and also authored four book chapters. He's a member of International Uveitis Study Group and member of scientific committees and Uveitis Society of India. He also was awarded YKC Pandit Award at Maharashtra Ophthalmology Society Conference in Pune 2011. I welcome Dr. Ankush Kavali for his talk on viral retinitis. Okay. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, well, I will... Uh, and uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to present uh, this uh, wonderful topic of viral retinitis on this uh, eye focus forum. So I'll be sharing my slides. I hope my slides are visible. Yes, sir. Okay. So. Uh, uh, before uh, jumping into the viral retinitis, uh, I would like to uh, uh, say a few words about how to differentiate the retinitis from coronitis. Uh, retinitis is a fluffy uh, yellowish white lesion, and uh, you can see the vessels passing through the lesions. There will be a good amount of vitritis. As compared to the coronal lesion, which will be deeply situated, there's a less pronounced vitritis, and you can see the uh, retinal vessel passing over the lesion. Uh, retinitis lesions can commonly seen in periphery of the retina, whereas in uh, coronitis, it's very rare to see the peripheral coronitis. If you are still in doubt, the OCT helps. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there's a full thickness retinal involvement, whereas here, the retinal layers as such looks normal. There's a, although subretinal fluid, but the primary uh, lesion is in the choroid. Uh, there is a confusing terminology like retinochoroiditis and chorioretinitis. Well, it's very easy with the primary lesion is a uh, retina and the choroid is secondary involved, it's a retinochoroiditis and vice versa when the primary lesion is in the choroid and the retina is secondary involved, it's a chorioretinitis. Well, uh, before you uh, uh, diagnose a case as a retinitis, you should be aware of some masquerade. For example, this patient was referred to us as a case of toxoplasma because the patient had this yellowish looking lesion. But if you see the lesion carefully, you can see the retinal vessels passing over it and there was absolutely no vitritis, which was absolutely clear. And now if you see this FFA, the FFA nicely pointed out the uh, aneurysms. So whatever yellowish lesion, what you see here, it's not a retinitis, but it's a liquid exudates because of this aneurysm. Whereas similarly in this case, the patient has got aneurysms and there are a lot of subretinal exudates. So remember this is not retinitis, but a lipid exudates. Uh, another case was referred as a post-fever retinitis because the patient gave history of fever and the patient had retinitis patches, retinitis uh, like uh, patches. But uh, when we did the patient's investigation, there was a myeloid shift and she was a case of chronic myeloid leukemia. So once you make a, di when a diagnosis of retinitis, it can be classified into anatomically as a peripheral retinitis or posterior pole retinitis, which is slightly less common. Pathologically, it could be necrotizing or non-necrotizing. Etiologically, uh, again, infectious and non-infectious as we usually classify all the uveitic entities. Among infections, we have bacteria, fungus, parasitic infections, and viral. 
So my today's talk is will be limited to the viral arachnitis. Now there are a lot of viruses, and the most common being herpetic viruses, herpes simplex, uh, varicella zoster, CMV, and rarely Epstein Barr as well as uh, HHV, human herpes viruses. There is another group of viruses which are arboviruses, that is arthropod born viruses. Uh, like chikungunya, dengue, West Nile viruses, this will come as an epidemic and will have a clustering of the uh, uh, retinitis cases coming to you. Other group, mumps, measles, rubella, influenza, and rarely adenovirus, and recently uh, COVID-19. Well, uh, there could be a hell lot of other viruses which are still uh, yet to be uh, discovered, still unknown, uh, which can be a cause of uh, retinitis. For example, COVID-19, we didn't know that COVID-19 can also cause a retinitis lesion. Uh, the discovery of COVID-19 was made long ago, but uh, whether it causes retinal lesions, we know recently after the pandemic. So similarly, there must be some other unknown viruses yet to be discovered, which can be a cause of uh, retinitis. So uh, starting with the commonest entity, ARN, acute retinal necrosis. So I, I would like to highlight that now if you see the uh, causes of ARN, the etiological agents, that's only HSV and VZV. The CMV, what we earlier used to consider, it's not out. That is according to the Sun classification too. So once you label an uh, entity as an ARN, it's understood that we are talking about only HSV, VZV, not CMV. So now it's almost mandatory to have a, a molecular diagnostics and uh, rule out CMV before you label the uh, condition as acute retinal necrosis. So uh, although the uh, uh, lesions are caused by viruses. The, those patients will not may not have history of uh, fever. So those patients will generally come with a, just burning of vision, very rarely uh, pain. Uh, anterior segment, the patient can have a very mild condition. Patient can have diffuse pigmented KPs, uh, uh, occasionally high IOP. Vitritis, if the patient is even competent, the patient will have a good amount of vitritis. If the patient is even compromised, the vitritis will be less pronounced. And you can see this. Uh, very uh, multiple yellowish lesions in the periphery. This lesions progresses in the circum uh, uh, circumferential manner or 360 degree and then towards the macula. As you can see here, if you observe carefully, the uh, vessels are also involved. So, uh, and very few hemorrhages, especially arterioles can get involved in case of ARM. And uh, this perivascular clearing is also a feature of ARM. Uh, this patient is uh, also having optic now uh, involvement, as well as you can see the macula has also been involved. Uh, this patient I remembered, uh, the patient came with a uh, complaints of blurring of vision, but the patient had a shallow anterior chamber, we couldn't dilate the patient, but the opto optos uh, imaging came to our rescue and nicely picked up this retinitis lesion. The patient had diffuse KPs, high IOP, and this uh, patch of retinitis. Now, if you look at the patch of retinitis, the first differential come to your mind is toxoplasma. But if you see carefully, there is again perivascular clearing in this case. So obviously, we went ahead with the anterior chamber tap and which comes positive for VZB. Now here, uh, the OCT passing through the section shows that there is a full thickness at an environment. And uh, I would like to emphasize here, there's a mild choroidal elevation as well. And here, the other section, which shows that it's a necrotizing retinitis. You can see the loss of tissue, there's a volume of ILM, and there's a mild choroid elevation as well. So earlier I used to uh, teach my students that whenever you see uh, choroidal elevation in the case of retinitis, think about toxo, it's not viral. But now uh, I'm convinced that the choroid will also get involved even in case of uh, retinitis lesion. For example, in this case, the patient came positive for VZV, responded to the antiviral treatment, and there was a choroidal involvement, a uh, slight uh, choroidal elevation. So it's not a differentiating features from toxo and uh, VZB. Uh, so as I said, AC tab is must to differentiate it from the CMV because the treatment is going to be uh, different for CMV and HSV and VZB. Uh, always keep a differential of CMV along with toxo, syphilis, as well as lymphoma. Well, if the patient is affordable, you can advise HSV, VZV, CMV, and toxo. Many times they don't. So at least a uh, serology for toxo and syphilis should be done. And the patient is not responding to the given treatment. Uh, do not hesitate to rule out lymphoma by doing uh, cytology, which is biopsies or imaging like PET scan. 
So uh, here is another interesting case. Again, uh, the patchy lesion, the first uh, uh, picture, if you see the first differential, you will think about that's toxo. But again, in this case, the anti-chamber tap is positive for HSV. Now the second picture uh, looks a similar lesion, the whole lesion, but in this case, the patient is HIV positive and the TPH positive. So second uh, picture, the patient responded well to the uh, penicillin treatment. The lesion, lesion just melted away within a week. So uh, here I want to emphasize that the uh, retinitis lesion morphologically could look similar, but the etiology could be different. So it's very, very important to rely on our investigations. Uh, I will not go into details of this uh, treatment. It's uh, there in your books, textbook, and uh, various publications. But remember, when you give uh, antivirals like acyclovir, valacyclovir, monitor the kidney function test. Uh, we uh, prefer, once we diagnose the patient as ARN, we prefer to start IV acyclovir first, followed by oral. Uh, there are papers uh, which uh, uh, says that uh, oral valacyclovir dose can be equivalent to the IV. So if you give high dose of uh, oral valacyclovir, like two gram uh, uh, four times a day, uh, that can reach the uh, plasma level similar to that you can achieve by doing uh, by giving intravenous acyclovir. And uh, many times the patient requires long-term uh, maintenance therapy, chronic uh, cases of uh, viral. Uh, and this treatment can be staged more than six months if the patient is not having side effects. Uh, if you want to achieve immediate uh, in good intravitreal concentration of this antiviral, intravitreal gansaclovir or foscanet can be given. Uh, so uh, such uh, aggressive treatment is recommended for uh, lesions which are uh, phobia threatening or optidix uh, threatening. Otherwise, repeated inter, uh, intravitreal injections are not uh, that recommended because it will disturb the vitreous and that will lead to uh, in, increased incidence of uh, retinal detachment. So you have to be very careful for intravitreal in, in, interventions. And obviously, uh, the topical and oral steroids to control the inflammation uh, do not give very high dose, but uh, around 40 mg or uh, even less than that, the anti-inflammatory dose of steroids are recommended for uh, viral retinitis. I had, uh, there was another publication in which the patient was treated with very high dose of, uh, dose of palacyclovir. It was 10 gram per day. The patient was not responding to the uh, routine and, uh, antiviral medications. So this is just to uh, tell you that uh, if the patient is tolerating this medication, uh, do not hesitate to give high dose uh, of antiviral uh, treatment. Now coming to another entity, uh, compared to the previous one, when I told you that a good amount of vitritis, here you can see the vitreous is all uh, clear. There is a various uh, less pronounced vitritis, but lot of retinal diffusion. The patient is a known HIV positive. He came on a wheelchair. The entire chamber shows one plus cells. The vitreous just 0.5 cells. As you can see, there, is, there are lesions at the posterior pole, mid periphery, as well as in the far periphery. And not only in right eye, but the similar uh, lesions you can see in the left eye as well. So there is no doubt the patient is no HIV positive, low CD4 counts. It's a case of bilateral CM retinitis. So uh, here uh, it's all zones are involved. There is a lesion at the posterior pole, there is a mid peripheral lesions and a peripheral. So all three zones are involved. The disease is aggressive. We have to treat the patient aggressively. So uh, three variants has been, three morphological variants has been uh, described, the fulminant, indolent, and posterior pharyngitis. Here, what we can see is fulminant as well as indolent, granular lesions in the periphery, and pizza pie and bush pie appearance. And uh, in contrast to the previous case, this case is a non-HIV. So uh, it's not always that the patient of CME retinitis should have HIV positive. There are many other cases in which the patient can be immune compromised but patient can be uh, uh, non-HIV. So this is such patient who presented with a history of myasthenia gravis for which he was an azorang and at the presentation he, he was on 13 mg of uh, steroids. Well, again, the retinitis lesion in far periphery, uh, uh, ACTAP comes positive for CMV. The patient was treated with gansaclovid and the lesion resolved. So it's not only uh, immune compromised patient, but uh, if you search the literature, there are almost more than 14 or 16 cases of uh, CMB uh, reported in immunocompetent patients. Again, a table which describes the treatment for uh, 
CMV retinitis. Again, it will be there in your textbooks. I will not go into details, but would like to highlight that in contrast to valaciclovir, the ganciclovir can cause neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, anemia. So apart from LFT and KFT, do monitor at least uh, CBC. And uh, those are the newer drug, letermovir uh, to treat the drug resistant CM retinitis. There's a recent publication just published last year, uh, CMV specific cytotoxic T lymphocytes immunotherapy for CMV retinitis. And there was another interesting publication in which the authors recommended to uh, monitor the level of uh, interleukin-8 in the ACPS uh, to decide when to stop the antiviral treatment. So if it is interleukin-8 is less than uh, 30, uh, we can consider stopping the uh, dancyclovir therapy for a case of CMA retinitis in HIV patients. And here, uh, another table which can, uh, which uh, differentiates ARN from other entities like uh, PORN and CMA retinitis. PORN is a progressive autoretinal necrosis. Now it's becoming a history. I don't know when I last seen the PORN case, maybe more than five years ago. Uh, ARN uh, in healthy patients, whereas in PORN as well as uh, CMV in immunocompromised patients, ARN, we have significant uh, vitritis, whereas in PORN and CMV, less uh, pronounced vitritis. In PORN, there are uh, deep retinal uh, lesions, granular, uh, without granular borders. So, uh, as I told you, the PCR is uh, mandatory for uh, retinitis case, unless you are 100% sure, uh, sure that it's uh, CMV and uh, HSV or VZV. If the patient is coming to you with a history of, say, chickenpox, and you see the ARN, then yeah, you can treat the patient in terms of VZV. Otherwise, it's always better to have a PCR documentation for uh, ARM cases. Uh, CMV, there was another interesting article in which uh, Inflant had uh, retinal race lesion and uh, the isolation of the uh, organism from the eye was not possible for some reason. So the blood was sent for uh, PCR and it was tested positive for CMV. Uh, I remember a similar case reported in adults as well, they did the PCR from the blood and it was positive for CMV. So, uh, well, one can consider the blood uh, uh, PCR for CMV if you really want to rule out uh, CMV and AC tab or vitress tab is not possible. And heart is the most important weapon uh, against uh, CMV retinitis. Uh, maintaining counts more than 100 uh, to decrease the incidence of CMV retinitis. Now, one should be aware of complications like retinal detachment and uh, a patient should be aware of that. And it's fairly common. Uh, I will say around 40 to 70 percent uh, patients of uh, ARN as well as uh, peripheral CMV retinitis can compete with uh, uh, this uh, retinal detachment complication within months after resolution because it leaves behind a, a necrosis and uh, multiple holes in the peripheral retina. So uh, those few publications uh, are some are in favor of a barrage laser, some are in against, some are favoring the uh, early vitrectomy, that is, uh, even before the patient develops uh, retinal detachment. Well, in our center, we don't uh, do the barrage laser and uh, uh, early vitrectomy, as mentioned by those authors. Uh, I have no idea about uh, uh, other centers in India. Uh, another complication is uh, sister macular edema which can be chronic after resolution of this uh, uh, ARN cases or uh, CMV retinitis cases. And those are treated with steroids, but under the cover of antivirals. Uh, we have reports uh, reported by Partho also. There was patient given intravitreal azotex under cover of antivirals for the CMV. Uh, there are reports of uh, systemic interferon given for CMV. CME uh, after uh, resolution of ARN cases. If the patient has got active retinitis and still there is a CME, one can consider giving intravitreal uh, dexamethasone along with uh, antiviral cover. And recently there was publication about tocilizumab and aflibercept given for uh, CME uh, in a viral uh, retinitis. Uh, chronic anterior uveitis is another complication what you can see even after resolution of uh, CV uh, retinitis and uh, those patients can come to you uh, after many uh, weeks or many months and this can persist for long. Those patients can require a prolonged topical steroids under cover of antivirals 
Well, one of my patient, I had tried topical interferon in this case. Patient had, a uh, uh, patient was a, a steroid responder, so I could not give him topical steroid to control his anterior segment inflammation. So in such case, I have tried only in one patient, uh, topical interferon. The, uh, and, I mean, it was a prolonged treatment or uh, more than six months, and uh, he responded to that therapy. Uh, well, uh, it's only the single case, so I will not emphasize upon that unless we have good evidence. Another controversial issue is <clears throat> immunomodulatory therapy in the management of post-viral inflammatory sequelae. Uh, whether one should uh, go ahead with the immunosuppression if you are dealing with uh, uh, this post-viral inflammatory sequelae in the form of chronic anterior uveitis or chronic sister macular edema. Well, uh, other uh, fraternity, uh, non ophthal um, fraternity have publications like this, the immunomodular therapy uh, in herpes simplex virus encephalitis. So patient had a herpes virus uh, encephalitis and to decrease the post-viral uh, inflammatory sequelae, the authors have recommended this immunomodulation. Well, there are a few experimental studies in which interleukin-6 and interferon gamma has been tried to control this uh, inflammation. Uh, well, I'd like to share one of my patient in which the patient was on uh, azathioprine. The patient had herpes zoster. We have treated this patient with uh, uh, antivirals and uh, we followed up the patient for a long period. The patient was on azuran and there was no recurrence of uh, herpes zoster even after uh, a continuation of this uh, uh, azuran tablet for almost more than a year. So uh, the even modulation in a case of uh, viral uh, retinitis, uh, one has to be further studied and uh, discussed. This was a beautiful picture of herpes simplex. It's very rare. I have not seen such a beautiful picture of retinitis lesions uh, and re reported by Kumar et al. Uh, again from SN, published in IJO. And there was a rare presentation of a uh, posterior uh, pole getting involved because of uh, retinitis. Well, uh, in this case, I think it's a parthos, yeah, right. It's a parthos case reported uh, in uh, AJO uh, 2019. Well, uh, uh, the PCR4 viruses was negative, but the patient had history of chicken pox and the patient responded to the uh, antiviral therapy as yes, cyclovir and all. And uh, this is another uh, report in which the author talks about the posterior pole getting involved in case of herpes uh, viruses. As you can see here, it's more of a hemorrhagic uh, uh, lesions what the patient uh, had here in this uh, particular uh, review. Uh, it, the retinitis lesion as such is very rare. So uh, more of a hemorrhagic uh, vascularity is what the patient had in case of herpes simplex virus. And this is our case, very interesting. The patient came with these findings. The entire chamber was uh, quiet that time. The patient came with vitritis and the patient had this very interesting looking uh, scars along the vessels, the sclerosis vessels. Looking at the scars along the vessel, the positive one to the patient was put on ATT. But after uh, a month, the patient lost to follow up. She said she returned after several years with this lesion. And the patient said that she took ATT only for a month and discontinued. Now the patient has got retinitis here. You can see the large patch of retinitis. So obviously, we'll not think in terms of uh, TB in this case, but we'll try to rule out uh, a viral uh, retinitis first. So anterior chamber tab now become positive for herpes simple, uh, simplex virus. And after treatment with acyclovir, the lesion resolves. After again, a uh, couple of months later, the patient had uh, uveitis in her uh, left eye. You can see the eyes uh, here. It shows the atrophic pattern which is more typical for viruses than the tuberculosis. And again, the anti chamber tab for other eye comes positive for herpes simplex. So prolonged treatment with antivirals, the inflammation is under control, the patient is under follow up more than five years, and there is no uh, recurrence of uh, retinitis or uh, choroiditis or vasculitis. Now coming to other entities, the arthropod bone, uh, let us talk about chicken guinea first. The fluffy, uh, uh, yellowish, whitish, uh, a cotton spot like retinitis lesions, as you can see here, reported 2008. There were, there were two big C's reported from India, one from our center, another from Arvind Hospital. So uh, the first series from our center, that was nine cases, out of which the three were positive for 
uh, three three had retinitis lesions. So all the cases, nine cases and 37 cases, they were diagnosed based on chikungunya IgM positivity. And uh, out of nine, three were positive. Uh, three had retinitis, which was our series. And the 30, out of 37 cases, the patient uh, two only two patient had retinitis. So uh, it's not that common to have retinitis lesion in chikungunya. The treatment is steroids for the macular edema, but uh, I found few articles in which the authors talks about uh, uh, use of doxycycline in the case of chikungunya. So doxycycline seems it also has got anti-chikungunya activity. Uh, dengue uh, cases, well, uh, the retinitis as such in this picture is not that pronounced, but if you see, there are a few cortical spot-like lesions, uh, uh, retinal hemorrhages. So it's more of a retinopathy than the frank retinitis in uh, dengue maculopathy. And here's our series of epidemic retinitis uh, when we are not able to differentiate say chikungunya from uh, dengue or from uh, rickettsia. We club all this uh, entity into the broad uh, terminology of epidemic retinitis because all of them, they come with a history of fever. Now in this series, again, if you see the cases of uh, viral retinitis, that is a chikungunya and dengue, that's not uh, uh, common, like 22% uh, IgM positivity for chikungunya, 15% IgM positive, uh, positivity for dengue virus, whereas uh, more, uh, the chunk of uh, the patient had a positive Wayflix test, which will point towards rickettsia retinology. And another uh, series what we published that was uh, more patients. And again, if you look at the incidence of this uh, Dengue IgM positivity and chicken IgM positivity is fairly low compared to the well Felix test. So uh, again, uh, the similar morphological pattern has been described for West Nile virus, a strong paper uh, for 52 patients, uh, well proven, and uh, other uh, other entities like Ricket CR, chicken and dengue were ruled out with serology and uh, PCR. The patient had at least patients had at least two uh, laboratory positivity for uh, vir uh, West Nile viruses. So again, if you look at the morphology of these lesions, they are fluffy whitish, uh, yellowish lesions at the posterior pole, like we have described for uh, in the, my previous slides before for uh, chikungunya. But uh, in contrast to uh, this uh, morphological presentation, there's another publication for the same virus, uh, West Nile virus, but the morphology is totally different. There's no retinitis as such, but more of a Choreoretinitis and uh, these lesions are uh, along the uh, nerve fiber layers. So, uh, a typical uh, multifocal choreoretinitis observed in 69% of cases. So, uh, same organism causing uh, a different presentation, different morphological presentation. And here in our series, we try to correlate uh, the seasonal variation of this uh, uh, epidemic retinitis with other. Uh, epidemics going on in the community. So chicken, gunya, dengue, measles and all. To our surprise, there is no correlation between those graphs with the graph of uh, epidemic retinitis. But uh, if uh, this is from the uh, IDSP, that's an Integrated Disease Surveillance uh, Program Registry, uh, the data was uh, uh, captured and compared with our data. But there was a big miss from this uh, registry that the cases of rickettsia and western virus were least reported. So, uh, so we can't, we don't know about the seasonal variation of rickettsia diseases and western diseases based on this IDSP. But fortunately, I found another article uh, uh, which was published by Thomas et al. from Bangalore, uh, from uh, St. John's, and uh, they have this uh, rickettsia seasonal variation. This is a systemic uh, rickets here, not the ocular. If you look at the, their graph and our graph of epidemic retinitis, they are uh, almost similar. So there is a less number of patients in uh, April, May, June, and we also had less number of patients of epidemic retinitis in month of May, June. So based on this uh, epidemiological data, we can say that the cases of this uh, cotton spot like retinitis lesion, which are at the macula and uh, around the disc, what we call it as posterior uh, post fever retinitis or epidemic retinitis, the most common cause could be uh, uh, rickets cell retinitis than the uh, chicken gunia or dengue. And here uh, we have COVID. So 
there are various entities now UNIC entities being uh, correlated with COVID because the patient comes positive for either RT-PCR or COVID serology. So again, a similar morphological lesions, the cortical spot-like retinitis lesion, this report comes from Iran. The patient has got the similar pattern as per as uh, our uh, post-war retinitis or epidemic retinitis. But in this case, the patient gives history of COVID and the patient uh, uh, and this patient, uh, they have isolated the COVID organism from vitreous fluid. So this is a strong evidence. But again, we know it's an endemic uh, pandemic going on. So it's no uh, surprise that you isolate the organism from tears or anterior chamber tap or from even from the vitreous cavity. Other report uh, from our center, the patient was positive for COVID IgM and uh, chikungunya IgM as well. And the patient had similar morphological presentation. And uh, then there was a big series of 17 patients. The patient were uh, COVID IgM positivity and uh, all, the, all of those patients had this uh, cotton spot like uh, retinitis lesions. So is it really the COVID uh, can cause this kind of uh, retinitis lesions, what we see for chicken guna, dengue, or say rickettsia? Well, right now there is no uh, big evidence, I will say. Not, no big evidence as far as the epidemiological data is concerned. So if you look at uh, this uh, peak, we had uh, this second wave in which uh, that was in month of May 2021. If the COVID is really caused for this kind of uh, presentation, multiple, multiple cotton spot like retinitis region of um, epidemic retinitis or post retinitis, we would have seen more number of cases coming to us immediately after this peak. For now, the pandemic is also going on. We are not seeing increased uh, incidence or uh, uh, change in a seasonal variation of this uh, uh, epidemic retinitis. So, in my opinion, we should uh, keep this uh, possibility of COVID causing this kind of uh, presentation to down the list compared to rickettsia, chikungunya, dengue. Uh, and, uh, and moreover, those uh, this kind of uh, uh, retinitis lesion, what I described in my previous slide, are not reported from uh, other uh, uh, other continent like uh, from West, where uh, they don't see a chikungunya, dengue, or a rickets cell. So they do have a pandemic going on over there, but uh, this kind of presentation has not been reported. Whereas they have reported other uh, morphological uh, entities like uh, small retinal infiltrates, outer retinal involvement. Uh, a few hemorrhages. So it's more of a retinopathy than the frank retinitis. It was a, a large series of 37 patients with severe COVID-19 and 38% uh, of them had retinopathy than the frank retinitis. So uh, let us talk about other miscellaneous viruses, not so common, but uh, can have a deadly presentation and not only site threatening, but can be life threatening such as SSP, the subacute sclerosing uh, and encephalitis. So this patient was reported by uh, More et al. The patient uh, had uh, posterior pole retinitis. If you look at the uh, OCT scan, uh, there's a necrosis and uh, ILM is there and there's a loss of tissue. So it was, it's a wild type of mutated uh, missile virus which can cause this uh, deadly presentation. Uh, the diagnosis is based on a uh, measles serology. Uh, you can isolate from the PCR. You can give uh, a CSF for uh, uh, measles serology. Uh, well, uh, talking about the treatment, it's there is no uh, proven treatment which uh, can cure the disease. And, uh, uh, many of those patients they land up uh, in the fatal complications like that. But systemic interferon. Uh, IV immunoglobulins as well as iso gene therapy has been tried uh, in treatment of SSP. Uh, if treated before the neurological signs appear, the prognosis could be good. Uh, many times the patient can compete with the ophthal uh, manifestation first and within uh, days or within a few weeks, the patient can develop neurological signs. So it's uh, uh, always better to start the uh, treatment on day one if you suspect for SSP. Other rare entities like mumps can cause this kind of retinitis. Well, I have not seen one, but uh, there are a couple of reports. Uh, again, the diagnosis is based on serial positivity, uh, IV acyclovir. In this particular case, the authors have tried hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy. It is another case of mumps virus. Uh, similar lesions, uh, as I showed you in the previous slide, which was for HSV. 
again the uh, uh, the history is going to be uh, typical the patient will have fever with uh, painful paratoid uh, swelling we can prove by doing igm and igg uh, serology the treatment isaclovir another rare entity hhv uh, just uh, very rare i mean i have never seen a granuloma in the retina like this caused by uh, any virus i remember reviewing uh, one case report uh, in which the patient had similar retinal granuloma but the patient uh, had uh, the patient was proven to be a case of sarcoidosis and they treated the patient with multiple psg whereas in this case the similar granuloma the authors have isolated hhv uh, another rare entity it's a epstein barr virus well now we have uh, pcr for uh, eb virus as well as there is uh, serology so this is a arn uh, kind of picture but the patient is positive for eb virus another case the posterior pole getting involved because of eb virus again the diagnosis based on pcr or serology uh, the anti herpetic virus uh, anti herpetic treatment with steroids uh, can help there was in this particular uh, patient the authors have Uh, gone further to try intravital methotrexate when the lesions were not responding to the given treatment another uh, very very rare uh, we have never seen but the cases have been reported from the african uh, continent this was from sudan again the posterior pole lesion of retinitis and the patient was diagnosed as uh, rift valley fever and in the left there was adenovirus but all those are very rare uh, just case reports and uh, we are not uh, seen that uh, commonly compared to the herpes viruses so in summary uh, when you see retinitis lesion study the morphology uh, study the patches are large or they are very small generally it, so this chart uh, is there you can find it in e of the site uh, the larger lesions are uh, suspect uh, uh, viral infections like arn hsv bcd cmv even toxoplasma Uh, if the uh, lesions are like cotton spot like lesions at the posterior pole around the disc suspect epidemic retinitis so take home uh, don't hesitate to do pcr testing because the morphological pattern pattern can vary it's very difficult nowadays to uh, confidently say that uh, it's a it, it's a hsv virus bzv or cmv because the patient has started coming to you at early stage of the disease so don't hesitate to do pcr uh, for at least hsv cmv Uh, rule out cmv because the treatment is going to be different uh, do at least uh, a blood work up for hiv and tpha do not wait for results of your investigation but uh, start the treatment on day 1 and uh, be careful about steroids and don't give very high dose of steroid in case your diagnosis is wrong then steroid will just going to worsen the situation of retinitis i remember one case in which the patient had peripheral toxo lesion and uh, Uh, it was looking like a arn so i started a treatment with uh, antiviral and steroids but the uh, patients worsen with that uh, so uh, unless you have uh, confirm uh, documentation from your lab investigation don't give high dose of steroids in case of retinitis and be aware of complications like uh, uh, rd as well as uh, chronic uh, complication like uh, persisting anterior uh, chamber inflammation or chronic uh, cystic macrolidemia thank you Thank you so much, Ankush, uh, for uh, taking us through that excellent set of cases of, and you are you have extensively covered all the viruses, and some of uh, retinitis, uh, some of the cases that we have never seen before. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, before starting the questions, uh, I'll ask Dr. J B Sir to give his comments because we have learned a lot uh, through him through his papers about uh, viral retinitis. So, sir, your uh, comment. no actually what i like to tell that uh, in case of viral retinitis particularly the herpes group of viruses don't forget to do the hiv testing that's a very important thing is the first step you should do the hiv testing and pcr is one of the test which is uh, uh, completely un unavoidable in case of uh, herpes group of viruses in particular so If you do your center do not have the PCR facility, don't uh, hesitate to send it to another center to get that infection uh, etiology uh, confirmed. Uh, so that's my feeling. 
And another important aspect over the years, I feel that the viral retinitis has increased, particularly acute retinal necrosis. And uh, you need to be knowing about that. And if you diagnose CMB retinitis in immunocompetent patients, think about alternate diagnosis as well. And one of the things is the toxo is a possibility. Though the toxo would not cause hemorrhage that much. And these are the few uh, points uh, which I like to share with you. Thank you so much, sir. I see Dr. Padma Malini, madam, is also there. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, uh, thank you for the excellent cases from your center. Uh, would you like to say something? Any comments before we go on to the questions, ma'am? Most of the points have been covered, like uh, Dr. Ankush, Dr. JB said, viral retinitis is a medical um, uh, ophthalmic emergency where we have to start the patient on empirical antiviral therapy. Steroids should not be given. Um, and also, especially like, you know, HIV, the progressive outer retinal necrosis uh, in HIV patients can have a severe core. We need to start the patients at the earliest. Thank you, ma'am. In addition to the systemic, interventional antiviral agents also play a role in the management of viral retinitis cases, especially herpetic group. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So we'll go on to the questions. Uh, Ankush, the first question is clinical differentiation points between inflammatory BRBO and CMB retinitis. Inflammatory BRBO from CMB retinitis. Well, uh, BRBO. So uh, basically, uh, in BRBO, uh, you are going to see cortical spot. So you are basically asking how to differentiate a cortical spot from the CMB retinitis. Well, uh, clinically, uh, well, you can, uh, if the anti segment is involved, that's uh, give you that can give you a lot of clues. Patients coming with high IOP, diffuse KPs, so you can have those anti segment clues. Uh, vitritis in the case of uh, CMV retinitis is going to be very uh, less pronounced, especially if the patient is immunocompromised. Whereas, if it is a case of uh, inflammatory BRBO and the patient has got inflammation, the vitritis could be uh, more. Uh, then uh, the as i uh, showed in my slides there are uh, different morphological patterns of uh, cmv the lesions of retinitis is going to be larger uh, compared to the uh, brbo those are going to be smaller coronal spot like lesions whereas in case of uh, uh, cmv retinitis the lesions are going to be larger uh, uh, along with hemorrhages and oct scan obviously it's going to help you there's going to be full thickness involvement in case of cmv there's going to be loss of tissue Whereas in case of inflammatory BRBO, if you get the scan over the OCT, uh, over the uh, uh, coronal spot, it's going to be, it's going to show inner retinal involvement and not the full thickness involvement. And uh, there will not be any uh, tissue necrosis. Yes. Thank you, Ankush. Uh, inflammatory BRBO, like you have also written in your uh, uh, papers that inflammatory BRBO is seen in post-fever retinitis or uh, rickets cell retinitis. So, and you also see a macular star. And of course, there are uh, other features like on uh, OCT angio, you will see uh, ischemia in the superficial vascular plexus. So those are some important differentiation points. Uh, Dr. Pamela, would you like to add anything to this? Ma'am, you have to unmute. Uh, I think it's covered it well. Uh, about these inflammatory BRV and necrotizing, and necrotizing and non necrotizing uh, retinitis. So, what do we actually mean by a non necrotizing retinitis versus retinopathy? Ankush, we like to say anything on that? Uh, differentiating necrotizing and non necrotizing. Uh, most of the what do we mean by that when we talk about non necrotizing retinitis? Uh, your voice is breaking. I didn't get your question. Oh, my question is the same. That how do we distinguish necrotizing and non necrotizing? What, what do we mean by non necrotizing retinitis? Yeah, so uh, necrotizing retinitis is a loss of tissue. As I showed in my uh, previous slides, the OCT scan, which shows the loss of tissue, uh, ILM is intact, uh, 
uh those uh, conditions are more common uh, in case of herpetic uh, viruses like hsv bzd cmv whereas in case of epidemic retinitis or uh, uh, post flu retinitis the cases uh, the retinitis caused by chikungunya dengue or uh, western virus this is non necrotic there, there is not uh, a full thickness involvement there is no tissue loss but uh, at the resolution you can see the thinning of the retina Uh, again, the herpetic uh, group of viruses can cause uh, uh, retinal involvement without causing uh, retinitis lesion as such. So uh, there are uh, multiple reports uh, of herpes zoster as well as herpes simplex ca causing only vasculitis without uh, retina getting involved. So this so is I also a group of yeah. I think I would like to um, emphasize. So what you're talk talking is only OCT. what if a patient comes to your clinic and we don't do an oct and clinically looking at it can you differentiate can you de describe the two entities different chikungunya retinitis when i'm seeing your patient's pictures or you see retinitis they all look the same more or less like herpetic ne necrotizing retinitis if it involves a posterior post so do you think clinically uh, we can make a differential if you don't I do will say OCT? yeah i will say if the retinitis lesion looking like a cotton spot so that's why i described that as a cotton spot like lesion The floppy, yellowish, white, uh, so those superficial lesion. So uh, those could be uh, non-necrotizing. Whereas uh, you can uh, clinically also you can see the retinal thinning uh, as well as uh, a flat uh, lesion, not that, uh, uh, not like a cotton spot like lesion uh, and uh, thinning of retina. Uh, clinically, I think we can differentiate uh, just by looking at the. Uh, clinical picture based on your experience uh, what has been described here is um, if if we can compare these lesions a stromal keratitis will be equivalent to a non necrotizing retinopathy it's not retinitis per se let's call it retinopathy but an epithelial keratitis is what we know is necrotizing retinitis that's the simile what has been described in literature so when you see very early retina herpetic lesions you may see that there's white dots in the periphery which we think it's an early inflammation of the retina so that stage we still call it that it is a retinitis where there is no destruction but we are seeing subtle lesions and probably they are not as closer to the inner retina they may be in the middle or outer retina but we are not seeing necrotizing retinitis picture what we uh, what we describe is in arn or cmv retinitis or let's say even in rickettsial retinitis because for me they all look very similar clinically the other thing what has been also described is that the non necrotizing is an immune mediated phenomena rather than necrotizing which is actually a virus in the retina which is causing cytopathic this is the hypothesis which nobody at all have actually uh, described that probably this is what is going on but we are not sure actually but it's just a hypothesis that what we mean by necrotizing and non necrotizing it's important to distinguish it's very easy to say that we are seeing necrotizing necrotizing is a pathological diagnosis and we probably use it as a clinical diagnosis but what we are seeing is retinitis retinitis in oct and histology will be tell, tell us whether there is any necrosis going on not every retinitis not every will have uh, necrosis so when it's not necrosis it is only the inflammation then probably it is called the non necrotizing type yeah what yeah, we other, are yeah, is retinopathy the other important clinical sign uh, if you really want to differentiate uh, necrotizing from non necrotizing is the presence of multiple holes so if you examine the retina in the periphery if you find there is a evidence of uh, retinal holes or rd so that will suggest that it's a, a necrotizing uh, retinitis what you are dealing yeah, with but that's an extreme stage of retinitis where you are seeing the damaged retina but if it's an initial part when do you call it non necrotizing and when do you call it retinitis and clinically, so clinically it's, uh, it's yeah, not yeah. Uh, we cannot differentiate all these different retinitis pictures even the toxo retinitis if it's retinitis then the oct pictures if it doesn't focus on choroid the retinitis will all the more look the same be it chikungunya nirikatsi west nile because it's all the damage in the retina some more and some less that is my understanding dr jb if you want to add anything as a histology what do you think oh this is that uh, necrotizing retinitis will be in the cmb arn all are full thickness retinal necrosis all are full thickness retinal necrosis we see that um, you know i have done some histopathology of uh, cmb retinitis 
where I can see the inclusion bodies even within the retinal pigment epithelial cells. So in the inclusion bodies in the inner retina, and uh, there is a full thickness retina, and it's a sudden transition from the uh, normal retina to the abnormal retina. This is a very sudden trans transition is seen. So we feel that rickettsial retinitis will not be a full thickness or chikungunya retinitis will not be full thickness? No, I don't think so. So, thanks. Thank you, sir. So, we we'll go to the next question now. So, uh, Ankush, the next question is, is induction and maintenance phase in the treatment of CM retinitis fixed or can be titrated as per clinical picture? Uh, induction phase, yes. If the lesions are in the periphery, they are not macular threatening, not near the optic disc, then uh, induction phase may not be required. You can uh, uh, treat this patient with uh, uh, 900 mgbd dose uh, and maintenance. So, uh, if the lesions are very small or in the periphery, not uh, site threatening, then uh, induction can be avoided. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how long we should give that prophylactic treatment or uh, maintenance treatment. I don't know anybody knows about it. How long well, you that's should why, give? That's why I mentioned in one of my slides that uh, the group have uh, come up with a uh, IL a monitoring of IL-8. So what they did is they uh, did anti tumor tap and they monitored the IL-8 levels. And they are saying that if the IL-8 level is less than 30, then you can consider stopping the anti-CMV therapy. Ankush, uh, as the the uh, discussion will be, if, if you orient this discussion for the postgraduate, no, so it will be very helpful. So can you tell us that how long one should continue uh, antivirals in this retinitis cases? Because many will uh, uh, won't have this facility to uh, analyze those vitreous fluid and all, no? So how until long the, one should continue the treatment? Yeah. Until the retinitis lesion is completely resolves. So if you see okay. uh, uh, yellowish lesion in the retina, Persisting, don't stop your antivirals. That's a short and sweet answer, I would say. So if I give, I give, I give, I give after resolution 90 days, 90 so days one, minimum. I think one thing it is very important to highlight here also, like conditions like in acute retinal necrosis, the treatment, uh, antiviral treatment is given mainly for two purposes. One is that healing of that particular retinitis lesion. And another important point is that it can actually spread to the other eye. So yes. even the bilateral also, bilateral involvement, we usually give the SACLIP, right? Yes. So uh, we'll move on to the next question, Ankush. Uh, the next question is role of uh, polymerase chain reaction in ocular fluid in the diagnosis of viral retinitis. I think you have already yeah. highlighted yeah. that. Well, JB sir has highlighted. So it's, I will say it's must. Uh, nowadays, uh, the patients are coming at early stage and it's very uh, difficult to differentiate CMV from HSV and VZV, uh, it has to be differentiated because the treatment is going to be different from CM and HSV VZV. So uh, PCR is mandatory. So PCR from which uh, ocular fluid? Aqueous aspirate no, or if see, you prefer... yeah, if you see the antechamber cells, uh, then yeah, you can uh, safely take the aqueous. Antechamber is completely quiet. Then probably the vitreous biopsy or vitreous tap. Uh, and again, you have to be very careful because it's uh, uh, necrotizing retina. So there is a chance that you might uh, land up in complication like return detachment. So it's always uh, better to have anterior chamber tab uh, than the uh, vitreous tab. Dr. Avilasha, Dr. Mamka, you want to add something? I think I agree with that. If we are seeing anterior chamber inflammation, then it's very easy. We can do it in OT, OPD. It's like easy to get the fluid. It's an OPD procedure under sterile condition. A vitreous biopsy means again, we have to take the patient. He has to be so it's more expensive and more there's a risk if it's a vitreous with necrotizing lesion. We always do not uh, we prefer to just stay away from vitreous because we may not induce more, more trouble. So I agree. Ma'am, can you briefly tell us how uh, the the uh, uh, procedure of taking an aqueous tap in the OPD just for the benefit of postgraduates? So aqueous uh, tap in the OPD, it's again explain to the patient what we are planning because yeah. it's an OPD procedure. Patient has to be uh, explained. The attendant needs to be explained. So if you have a special yeah. OR, small OR, it's better that we do it in a sterile place and it is a sterile condition. You wash your hands, gloves, sterile gloves. And we don't do actually, uh, we don't have to drape the patient in the OPD or something, but it can be either done uh, on the slit lamp or we can do it 
with the simple under direct of thalmoscopy yeah. light so it depends upon the comfort how you are comfortable put paracin drops put apidin drops make the patient comfortable explain the patient and uh, patient is lying down so it, we take a normal cotton bud and dip it in the paracin and we tell the patient that he should not not feel anything right there should not be any wincing and she should not get scared obviously we do it in adults kids we have to take to the or and we put a wire speculum until that time keep talking to the patient that's what i do because it's very apprehensive somebody poking your eye it's not an easy thing right and then you wash your hands put this to right glass and then again some there should be an assistant for you to assist and you take a 30 gauge needle and then you have to tell the patient i usually take the bud and again press on the uh, sclera or uh, one or two points so that you know that patient is not feeling anything and the apprehension is gone so it, you take your time to explain i don't like that the patient's attendants are there because they get hassled and they, for them it's like poking the eye so i tell them to wait outside if they want but again it depends upon the comfort and then just take a 30 gauge needle and also it has to be undilated pupil preferably so clear lens you always have to stay away so it's a undilated pupil just go near the limbus and on the iris stay on the iris with a 30 gauge needle and uh, bevel up and take the fluid and then just give it to the microbiology people and you close that point because there will be hypotony as you are uh, taking the fluid so use the bud to press the entry point and then patch the eye for at least an hour putting apidin drops <clears throat> open the patch see the patient after one hour and start the topicals and wait for the results but i start my treatment uh, clinical judgment i don't wait for pcr results and then start and then we also see the patient next day any procedure you do you have to see the patient next day thinking that yeah. there should not be any more damage because there's always a risk of infection so that's that's how i do thank you ma'am uh, so we'll go on to the next question uh, ankush this i think you have you will know management of post pyrexia retinitis post fever well, uh... yeah so now the well uh, when we started uh, dealing with those cases initial treatment we were thinking that uh, it's because of so viruses herpetic group because the patient will come with stroke fever uh, and the diagnosis will be viral uh, fever so we used to give antivirals for this then we started giving uh, steroids because of the macular edema uh, then uh, we uh, came across few cases which were worsening and then the viral flicks test started coming positive we started adding doxycycline so uh, i did one study in which i compared the group who received only doxycycline and the patient who received doxycycline and steroids there was no difference so uh, uh, i have stopped giving steroids uh, completely oral steroid uh, completely uh, in this uh, uh, particular entities a topical yes depending on the antihistamine involvement but uh, doxycycline was well uh, even if you give as a monotherapy so only in cases in which the optic nerve is involved a lot of vasculitis then you can add uh, or a steroid or if the inflammation is persisting uh, more than a week then i add uh, steroids along with doxycycline otherwise uh, doxycycline monotherapy with topical it works well in the epidemic retinitis or post covid retinitis dr jb sir would you like to add from your experience uh, i i i give that uh, doxy plus steroid both Yes, so do you start steroids on the same day i start steroids on the same day okay uh, so do you uh, uh, only give oral steroids or do you also give uh, sometimes do you prefer giving local steroid like posterior septin and along no, with doxycycline i don't give posterior septin okay thank you sir uh, so we'll go on to the last question uh, dr mamta uh, can you tell us how to differentiate kps of cmb retinitis from that of other causes of uveitis i think padma is the best thing <laughs> yeah she can give a <laughs> chapter on <laughs> <from> this <laughs> so ma'am video is off so i was wondering whether to ask okay her. i'll ask padma to explain that <laughs> Okay, coming to the keratic precipitates, the viral uveitis is characterized by the diffuse fine capes, which is distributed throughout the cornea. We see it in herpetic uveitis. Whereas in CMB, there are different patterns have been described where the capes are present in the central cornea, or they can have a linear pattern of capes or coin-shaped capes. These are the capes have been described in CMB. anterior uveitis however the pcr test is help us to 
confirm the diagnosis as per the recent guidelines. We don't diagnose CMV based on the clinical presentation. We need to have molecular diagnostic yeah. confirmation to diagnose CMV anterior uveitis as per the recent guidelines. Thank in confocal, we also we can help us to differentiate between in, in various kind of uveitis in CMV anterior uveitis, outline -like pattern of keratic precipitation so, 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 the characteristic feature. CMB so anterior uveitis. So that is not ask... present in all the cases, uh, but hmm. in selected subset of CMB anterior uveitis have this particular pattern. If it is present, it helps us as an additional diagnostic tool hmm. to confirm the diagnosis of CMB so, anterior yeah. uveitis. So uh, my two uh, points my two here. Points here. When I see a suspect uh, KPs, KPs when you are seeing, if the KPs cross the horizontal line, that is suspicious of viral uh, uveitis, one viral keratouveitis or viral uveitis. Pigmented KPs, again, as we all know, that also points towards the viral entity. And clusters, if I'm seeing, what Padma also said, rounded KPs or linear KPs. Or, um, so if I'm seeing cluster of KPs, different clusters, that also makes me suspicious of CMV uveitis more than other HSV VCV. But the other point, what you said about the guidelines, I do not think I agree with this. Actually, having the clinical experience, the AC, the ACPCR, Equestar PCR, most of the time is negative, despite that my clinical diagnosis is hypertensive anterior uveitis. So my treatment does not depend on Equus. If it comes positive, that is just an add-on. But my clinical diagnosis is much more important in any patient with viral uveitis if I'm seeing clinically all these features and glaucoma unilateral, I go ahead. It's sometimes difficult that to differentiate between HSV, VCV versus CMV. That is a tough call because most of the time PCRs don't help us in this because the load is less or we have not done the exact uh, time when the inflammation was high. So I think I, I depend on clinical diagnosis, not on the Equestar. Yeah, most of the times we go by the clinical diagnosis. First of all, the molecular diagnostics is not accessible to most of the people. And yeah. also, even if it is there, affordability is the question. Exactly. But I just mentioned as per the recent guidelines of CMB anterior uveitis. But PCR most of the time is negative. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you may have to do the repeated PCRs. The yeah. first time may be negative. The third or the fourth episodes, we may get positive. Yeah, but it's quite expensive on the patient's cost, I think. It's very costly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we are done with the questions today. And thank you so much, Ankush, for the excellent presentation and your time and effort uh, for making this program a success. Uh, thank you, the uh, thank you all the chairpersons, uh, Dr. Mamta, Dr. J B Sir, and Dr. Padma Malini, and thank you, Partho Sir, and over to Subhav. Uh, thank you, everyone, for this wonderful discussion. And I must say that as we are progressing in more and more into it is the panel discussions are becoming more and more interesting. And uh, yeah, that's quite. Uh, it's good that we have all these discussions and perspectives that are coming from different parts of the country all put together in one place. So thanks to all of you. Uh, there is a little thing that I have to tell the postgraduates and that is uh, then uh, we kind of going uh, all the way for the uh, postgraduates who are exam appearing. So what we are doing is this is I focus online. That is the Insta page. So you can take the QR code and start joining. And uh, because we just want to make things more regulated for all of you, there will be a recap of all the sessions which will be put up on the Insta page so that you can go on to the topics that you have missed, maybe, or maybe you do not remember, but it has been covered or are exam uh, oriented and important. So all the links will be reshared in the sequence for all of you to see. So just join the Insta page of iFocus Online and uh, it will be provided for you. And these are there for your keep, precious keepsake as well. So you can go back to your uh, uh, link whenever you want to and you can take a look at the all the uh, videos put together. And as we said that I focus physical, we all will see you there. And it's going to be quite an interesting uh, 
session that is being prepared and soon all of you will be receiving the final session just give us a day or two we have been getting emails about the session so just in two days it will be there in your inbox and hoping to see all of you there thank you everyone and on the february 3rd we have the talk on ocular toxoplasmosis by dr daniel santos so we'll see you there Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ankush. That was wonderful recap of the whole retinitis. Thank wonderful. you. Thanks, all of you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.